Hello everybody, again it's Uncle Bruce and we are moving towards the end of Three Fin. That's Shark Cap Table Three Fin. We are now in the fun part. We're going to do tab number five, exec sum images, and number six, exec sum numbers. Now I want to show you exec sum six first. One section is very important, so we're going to go over there. Now look, right here, and look, it's just down from the top, okay? One, two, the third section here is talking points supporting founder valuation. These need to be filled out first, but they really are going to help you write your executive summary, which is in three exec sum images. So look, we've got 15 questions. What's the problem? Notice you only have a few lines to write. Why is your product awesome and why is it better than what currently exists? Well, of course. Why will users pay for it and how much? You really have to ask yourself, oh, I invented this great widget, but really? Does anybody really need to buy it? Make sure that's the case. Sometimes you become enamored with your own product and nobody gives a darn. What does it cost to acquire a customer and what is the churn rate? Look, acquiring a customer can be a long, lengthy, expensive process. And if you get them just once and it costs you $200 and you're only getting 50 bucks off a customer, that's not a good deal. So make sure it's the other way around. Cost you 10, you get 200. And it would be nice if they had recurring revenues, but sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes you don't have a business that has recurring revenues. You're just selling individual units. So you got to be very careful because it could be cost too much to get one. You have no further business. What's the lifetime value of a customer? Well, you got to look at it. If there's a recurring revenue, maybe they buy one and then they buy another and another and another, and pretty soon that you know $100 product goes to $500 through time. Okay, that's your lifetime value. And it's not 100 years, it's just a short period of time. What's the size and opportunity and market share you intend to capture? Well, everybody wants to do 10 or 20, 30 billion dollars. Be realistic. Um, VCs love to see billion dollar markets at the very minimum because otherwise if you don't become a big cheese or a big fish in that pond, billion dollars won't make you much. You know, oh, I'm the big cheese in a hundred thousand dollar market. Really? Okay. Discuss the strengths of your team and why is it the right one to do it? This is very important. You got to have good people to do your deal and uh, you got to make sure that you don't hire people that are dumber than you. Hire people that are smarter. It's tough on your ego when you realize somebody could run the company better. But that's exactly what you want to get is smarter people than you. And don't be afraid to let them argue with you. You know, it's okay if they argue. That's a way to create. What is the level of competition? And oh, please don't ever say there isn't any competition. There is always some form of competition. If you want to say there's limited competition and describe it, just don't pick something that's about this big around and say, gee, there's no competition in that little circle, but all around there's a lot of competition. Tell people about that big circle. Let's scroll up a little bit here so we can keep on going. What is your competitive and what are your competitive advantages? Features price distribution management. There's got to be something that's unique that helps you against all the other big guys or the, all the other competitors. Figure it out. Make sure you can quantify it and describe it. What is your current plan of attack? Best to show it as a timeline with phases. Yeah, time and money and money and time. Very important to have that clear. We do not include a timeline in this because everybody has their own ideas for timelines. And you can do it right in Excel. It's the easiest thing to do in the world. What is the project's current status and where are you in the timeline? Well, you got to have a timeline in order to tell people where you are. So look for these goal posts or uh, milestones. You know. If you have to make a software product, you can't do it until you get the algorithms correct, right? So don't be making a design and making the package until you get the algorithms. It's making sense, folks. What will be your development and revenue milestones? Well, here we are. In this case, you know, a couple months to work the web app, a month to fully test, uh, two months to make videos. Yeah, it seems to be two months to make videos. They take a long time these days. And six months of advertising, and then maybe you're off and running. This happens to be what we're thinking of doing with our little product. Let me scroll up here and get a few more of these points. How will you use your funding? Well, you need a good projection model, and that's why you're going to utilize this model uh, to figure out how much you need as you go along. 
you just can't say, well, you know, I need 100000 bucks or $5 million and everything would be just fine. Mm-mm. Figure it out. Play the game. Scenarios 1, 2, and 3 and see what happens. How will you advertise and market your product or services? Oh, boy, that's really an important one. You can look at all different ways and you can spend a whole bunch of money. I make a big recommendation. Do little tests. Try it and see if it works. Do it again. See if you can get it bigger. Keep on going. Don't take your money and say, well, I'll just throw it all at once. I'll make it happen. Oh, boy, you're going to go right down the toilet. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll be right down the tubes. Other considerations such as direction of existing and newer technologies, patents, freedom to operate, trademarks, copyrights. I can't tell you how many times I've come across deals and then two weeks later I see another one just like it. I think that the first deal I saw, that those people hadn't looked around to see what else is going on. All they were doing is thinking, oh, my idea is so great. And they never thought that anybody else would have the same darn idea. It happens. I think the best way to do it is sit there and watch a market for a while. See who's talking about it. Have a couple of ideas. As you get into a market, think about it. You're going to find more and more out. It just doesn't happen in two weeks. One time I sat down with a friend and we actually invented Uber. I was completely oblivious to Uber. with a great software program. He said, you know, we got cars. They sit in our driveway all the time. Why don't we rent them out? We'd get people to rent them and drive them for us. Well, that was almost Uber. And then one of my friends heard that idea and says, Bruce, where the heck have you been for the last three years? There's this company called Uber. And I went, well, son of a gun. But we didn't spend any time. It was all done over about two whiskeys and about 30 minutes. We had it all invented. Well, all right. So we lost a couple whiskeys, but it was no big deal. Patents and freedom to operate. If you have a patent, you ought to spend some time to figure out. It's like an army tank inside a big ring of trees. Like these are trees and your army tank is in the middle of this. If your army tank is 20 feet wide and the trees are 10 feet wide, or there's a space between them, the army tank's not going to be able to get out. It's going to be just contained in this little area. That's kind of like what freedom to operate is. Having a patent is wonderful. If you can't operate in a big enough area, you don't have much of a value to that patent. Trademarks, copyrights, you know, get them if you can. Um, search around, look, hire a good attorney. It costs money to do things. Maybe you could do a trademark by yourself, but a patent, uh-uh. Don't fool yourself. Do a good patent search. I have a friend that one time nearly lost his entire fortune because he didn't realize that an assigned patent didn't come up in the search. So he goes off and makes this above ground storage tank um, system that was looking for the thinning of metal at the bottom due to corrosion and a bigger company sued the heck out of him. He was very lucky he got out from underneath it because there was ill will between all of these guys and oh my gosh he nearly stepped in it big time but he extricated himself and the business then failed completely because there was no patent protection. In fact there was a patent suit against them for infringement and that'll kill a business so be sure you do your homework and have your patent attorney do your homework and then keep looking. Remember, if somebody comes up with a patent and um, you got a patent and you don't enforce it, they start to infringe, you can lose your patent. And one other thing about patents, just because you have a patent doesn't mean it's not going to be tested in court. Patents are 20 years long. The first two or three years of a patent is when you're going to have some court action if anybody cares. There are lots of people out there that are always looking at patents that are immediately you know, made public. Someone gets a patent and they're issued and the patent office tells you about it. So everybody's looking at those patents to see if there's any possible infringement. And if there is, you're likely to get some kind of a lawsuit against it testing its validity in the first several years. The last two or three years of a patent aren't so good either. Uh, I was involved in a little publicly traded company. We had a great big patent portfolio, and I started looking at the patents, and I started looking at when these things were going to expire. Hey, one was going to expire next week, another six months from now, another a year and a half. That didn't give us any runway to do anything with. So, so we got some new patents, and that's another whole story. But um, the 
time that a patent is most, most value is within about three to four years up to about 12, 13 years. If you get a patent at the 15th year, you only got five years to make it happen. You know, that's not enough time. So it's the midsection. If you want to buy a patent, make sure there's at least 10 to 12 years remaining in that patent. Okay, folks. Um, now we want to go back to the five exec sum numbers because here's where we get into the fun stuff. Look, what we have here is a nice little cover. And a lot of these words are coming from this section over here. You might remember this. The start. Remember this little page over here? It's one underscore start. So here you put in the name of the company, your website, the name of the guy, the founder number one, his phone number, the email, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what? We utilize all this information elsewhere. So here we go back to this five exec sum images. And we have, you can enter this stuff yourself, okay? You can enter this stuff yourself, but this is coming from that sheet, as are these guys here. So, that's the cover. And, oh, yeah, this is my mug shot holding a tablet with sharkcaptable.com showing. Put your own picture there, please. Now, remember I mentioned the summary of opportunity because we had to go through those 15 important questions. Well, those ought to be woven into some kind of a very nice, simple executive summary describing who, what, where, when, why, and how. This page here, Images and Links, is about a place that you could put pretty colored logos. You could write links. You do almost anything. It's all open for you to do what you want to. Now, management team, okay. There are four spots for managers, eight little bullet points. You got to make nice, simple sentences or phrases. Now, I put my picture in here because I didn't have any from you or your partners, but you get the idea. There are four of them, and you don't have to use all of them, but pick a nice picture and make it fit. Make sure you don't stretch the face so it's real long or real fat. You know, it's okay if you show a little white along here, but make sure you still can put your name in it. All right. Now, we have a proposed offering and expected investment returns. You've actually already done this work because this one comes up. This one comes up. All of this on this one pa last page, you've already done all this, so it's easy. It's all automatic. Now, if you want to come over here and change these things, we do have... you want to come over here and change these things, we do have the ability to do that. I'm going to slide this thing over a little bit so you can see it. Nope, it's not going to go that way. Sorry. All right. Um, what you won't see is the names of these things, but basically when you get the program, there are little spinners right here, and you can change these pre-money and the, uh, the amount of the investment and uh, the exit year and if you play with these, you'll see that these numbers are actually going to change. Look at that. See, that's the year. And these revenues will be the same because this is just not time sensitive. This just is seven years of the high. But look what happens if you decide you want to go to the low. See, now we're changing. See that? You can play the game if you want to. All right. If you had royalties, there would be a section here for the royalties. And here's your beginning cash and your ending cash. So you can talk to people about how much cash you got. And, of course, what you're seeing is the net after you've raised the cash. You've got to make sure you don't run out, and that's why you show the ending cash for the seven years. Because after you get your investment, the beginning of year one, you're going to spend it. Well, you've got to make sure that you don't have holes, negative numbers here. <laughs> Amazing. Isn't that interesting? That's what we're doing. We're trying to avoid going bankrupt because you don't have enough money or you spend too much. All right. So now we've done that page. Let's go over to six exec sum numbers. Now, I'm going to scroll to the top here. The first thing that you're going to come up with, again, is something that you've already done, the founder pre-money valuation. There's nothing to do here, folks. If you don't like these things, then go back to where it is in the dealmaker and change them. 
And if you do that, you'll probably have to change the deal a little bit. But guess what? That's what it's all about. Only a few inputs and a lot of calculations. You don't have to do much in this model, but think. Really, I know you guys can think, and new ladies can think out there, so do it. All right, so now let's come down here and take a look at something else. Again, this is all done for you. This is the capitalization table and investment pitch. So here we have the capitalization table, and you've seen the stand and deliver pitch. Now what you can do, if you don't like this, you can copy and paste into Microsoft Word, paste just the values, not the formulas, and then you can make an edit, and then you can copy it and put it back in there. It's that simple. You see, I put the 6ED, for instance, because we have lots of different versions, and therefore I need to have some way to determine which one I'm looking at because it's really complex. Now, guess what? Here's the talking points, the supporting founder valuation. We've already gone through this. It's wonderful. And then we get down to the income statement, and we have a balance sheet. See? Balance sheet. And we have a cash flow statement. But which one are we going to be looking at? Well, I'm going to scroll to the top here. It's very simple. It's just out of sight here, but I guarantee you it's there. And right here is a spin button. And if you watch right here, you're going to see. I'm going to move it down a little so you can see it. Okay, now watch right there and watch this. Look at that. It says mid case. It just changed all these numbers to the mid case. And of course, if we spin it down one more time, we're going to get the low case. Mid, high, mid, low. So you can play the game and look at all this stuff and everybody's happy. But you can only print one at a time. But hey, if they want different versions of it, print this section three times and just label it. It's that simple, folks. Now, remember, Excel has the ability to change the footers, and you know how to do that. So go in there and put your company name at the bottom left. Don't worry about the stuff in the middle or the stuff on the right, because those are all page numbers and, and uh, little statements about uh, accuracy and veracity of information contained. Now, you can print this by just simply clicking on both of the both of the tabs. You can print it by clicking on both the tabs and doing a print. Print as a PDF. It works. And this is all set up. You don't have to set up any print areas. Uh, if you want to just print one at a time, you know, let's say somebody says, I just want to see your management team. See these little red lines here? Take your cursor, come down here like this, and go like this. Copy, come over here and open up Microsoft Word. There's Word, Word, Word. There it is. Word's right there. Okay, come in here. Come in here, and um, we want to set up Word. Blank document. We come in here, and we want to do the layout. We want to do the margins. It's going to be horizontal margins. So we want the narrow margins, and we got to set it up so that it's a landscape. We just copied it in there. And you know what? This may be a vertical format. Um, no, it's horizontal format. All right, so I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to hit this little guy like that. There, horizontal format. See how nice that is, all clean. And you're in good shape then. Well, folks, that's it. Five and six are done. It's that easy. See you around soon. Bye.